Summertime is when most of us drag out the sunscreen and water toys. I like my water toys. But recent headlines are making it a harder decision on what to buy and when to apply. We sort through research today on the morning medical update. Good morning. It's Friday, June the 3rd. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, sitting in for Jessica Lovell, who is off today. Thanks for joining us on Facetube, YouTube, and Twitter. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I, you know, I can't read. Live now to the University of Kansas Health System campus as we dig into a new adventure. When you think of the health system, herbs and vegetables don't come to mind. Why that's all changing, we'll check in with Alexis Del Cid coming up in about 25 minutes. In just 15 minutes, Dr. Dana Hawkinson will join us with the latest COVID-19 numbers from here at the health system and a little conversation about some breaking news. But first, sun and water, the two things that make summer what it is here in the metro. What the science says about keeping safe is just ahead. So make sure to get your questions sent in to us on the YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the Medical News Network. You'll find links to those right here on your screen. So why is it so important to put on sunscreen? Numbers from SkinCancer.org show an estimated 90% of skin damage is caused by the sun. Having five or more sunburns doubles your risk for melanoma, and more than two people die of skin cancer in the U.S. every hour. But when detected early, the five-year survival rate for melanoma is 99%. Joining me now in the studio to talk about sunscreen and keeping your skin in good condition is Dr. Gary Doolittle, an oncologist and a good friend of mine here at the University of Kansas Health System. All jo also joining us this morning are pediatricians Dr. Stephen Lauer and Dr. Sean Sood. They will talk to us about pool and water safety coming up in just a few minutes. Good morning to my whole panel. Morning. Good morning to y'all. Dr. Doolittle, there's been a lot of news recently about raising alarms for sunscreen. Talk about the protection they offer from the sun. Yeah, good question. I think that's uh, become a real issue for the public at large. Are sunscreens safe? And uh, it's a very reasonable question to ask, particularly parents uh, worried about their kids. You know, we go about this in a multi-pronged uh, approach. And the thing is, it's all about sun safety. It's not about staying away from the sun completely. It's about being safe when you are in the sun. So seek the shade when you can. Avoid the sun from 10 to 4 if you can. But if you're out and enjoying yourself, just protect yourself. And part of the breakdown or part of the concern is the difference between a sun block, if you will, and a sunscreen. A block actually keeps the UV rays from the sun penetrating the skin. Uh, it just blocks it completely. But the others, the sunscreens, are chemically based. And through a chemical reaction, they prevent the UV radiation from absorbing. Our challenge, we know the sunblocks for the most part are not absorbed. Uh, we have to worry about inhalation with uh, some of the blocks, but with the chemical uh, screens, that's a little different story because we know some of them will be absorbed through the skin. And the question is, does that systemic absorption result in any harm? So one of the things I've, I caution patients is to take a look at uh, websites and become well informed. I could go through the list of chemicals for you. You won't remember them. Quite honestly, uh, I won't remember them. So we won't do that, but would tell you that if you go to environmentalworkinggroup.org, um, there's a listing of what the concerns are. And then I'd also tell you to go to the American Academy of Dermatologists. They have the most reasonable recommendations on their website, uh, these concerns that the FDA might have. And one last thing, Dr. Seitz, there's a difference between declaring a sunblock or screen safe and effective versus unsafe. So the two that are declared safe and effective in our country right now is zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. So if you pick up a bottle, those two you can remember, those of you that are in my age group, the white nose that we used to see at the pool, those, those are considered safe. And then the others are, are still on the market. We're still using them. The FDA has just asked for more information about potential harm over time. So wait a minute, you mean that white stuff I put on my face that looks dorky is really the best stuff still? It is not absorbed systemically. And I think particularly for parents of young children, I think they really, and rightfully so, worry about that. So if you stick with a zinc oxide base, you're, you're not gonna have that absorption and not gonna have that worry. I still use sunscreen. Okay, right, so I still what, use so a chemical what kind block. Do you use? 
uh, probably won't say it on, I won't on say air. It on okay. the air, yeah, yeah. but would tell you that part of our challenge with sunblock is we don't put enough on. Uh, you'll get this doctor's sites. If you have a sun lotion, you should have at least a jigger full of that sun lotion, and that should be applied everywhere, right? Most of us will spray a little bit or we'll, we'll uh, apply some, but we really don't apply enough. And the other challenge we have is that when, when it's wet, you, you know, you can have a challenge with that or reapplying it two hours. And this is so bad, I'm a melanoma doctor and I always get the first application and sometimes I forget that second. So we really want to automatically at the two hour point reapply if we're gonna stay out in the sun. So, you know, if you want to be goofy like me, what you do is you get those fly fishing wide hats <laughs> and all the long clothes, the long pants, long sleeve shirts, maybe something around your neck. So the only thing you really have to do is your face because everything else is pretty protected. Those sunscreen clothes, they help block the sun too. They absolutely do. And it's really kind of gratifying. If you go by a pool. Thank you. I have never been called gratifying the way I look when I go fly fishing. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep that in my memory. Now. You go right ahead. If you go by a pool, clearly half the kids will have rash guard type shirts, right? I mean, it's becoming the norm. And when you and I had white noses with zinc oxide, we were not the norm, right? No. Now this whole effort has moved has moved forward. Schools are well informed, parents are well informed, and that's resulting in you know safer sun practices for, for young kids. Well, one of these days I'll bring in my super cool shirts with uh, my fly fishing stuff and a little hoodie that goes with it to keep my ears protected from the sun. Man, it is just so awesome. All right, but the problem is, that, of course, too much sun and melanoma kind of travel together. Talk to yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, that is, it really is a challenge. And part of the thing or part of the reason that a medical oncologist would focus on this or a doctor that treats his melanoma patients is sun exposure is modifiable. We know there are certain genetic conditions that will put you at risk. We know patients that are chronically immu immunosuppressed are at risk, but those are all challenges that we have medically or our genetic makeup, and there's not much we can do to change that. Sun exposure is different. We can enjoy the sun, but, but be safe. So again, the general recommendations, uh, apply sunblock, an adequate amount, SPF 30 or greater, sun protective clothing. If you can avoid the sun from 10 to four each day, that's optimal. A young parent, that's not gonna happen. We have lots of activities we gotta get the kids to. Go and enjoy the sun, just protect yourself at the same time. So you mentioned that, I think it was the Environmental Working Group, is that right? That's correct. And they have a study that said 75% of more than the 1,850 sunscreen products rated poorly for skin protection mm -hmm. or have ingredients that could be harmful. Hence the steerage a little more toward sunblock because as you mentioned, not absorbed, mm -hmm. safer, and I don't think my shirt's been absorbed yet. Fair enough. I think the issue really is, remember, it has not been shown to be harmful. My concern about the, the level of conversation is that it's not that they've been shown to be harmful, it's they've been shown to be absorbed. Uh, and there are some chemicals that are harmful. I don't want to get into all the details with it, but m from the most part, the FDA is just asking for more information, more study, just over time to be sure that the agents we're using are safe. And we forget sometimes that our skin's really our skin really absorbs a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so anything you put on it, which is what sometimes makes those superficial anti-itch medicines effective mm -hmm. part of the time, or steroids that you put on topically effective, because your skin does absorb that stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so as summer rolls in and weather heats up, many of us are looking forward to taking a plunge into the pool or the river, in my case. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, swimming is the fifth most popular activity in the United States. And while the water may be fun, it can also be dangerous for children. Pediatrician Steve Lauer on Sean Sud, uh, I knew I was gonna say that wrong. Did I say that wrong? You got it right. Not bad, yeah. okay, are here to talk about that. According to the CDC, drowning is the leading cause of accidental death amongst children under four years old. More than 60% of drownings for this age group occur in swimming pools. What can we do, guys? What can we do to protect our kids? Dr. Sue. Thanks for having me on, and it's good to be here this morning. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do, but I think, number one, it starts out with being aware and vigilant, especially when you're watching your children. Um, awareness is key. And I think around the house, making sure all buckets are empty, the bathtub is drained is really important as well. Pools should also be fenced around, and uh, things like learning CPR and swim lessons when your child is ready are really important. But one, two, and three is just being aware and vigilant, and then having an honest conversation with your children when they're older about 
not being impaired during bodies of water, whether that's the open water or swimming pool, would be uh, the biggest points of advice. You know, and then when you say not be impaired, I think you're kind of saying don't be drunk when you're around a lot of water. I'm exactly saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, talk a little bit about drought, dry drowning because you, met, you, you said something about small amounts of water in your house and things like that. Talk to me. What is dry drowning? Sure. So dry drowning is a term that is not an official medical term but used often in the news. And what it, what it implies is a small amount of water that gets inhaled and it leads to an overreaction or a upper airway muscle spasm. And so your airway still closes and you treat it just like drowning. And what, what's so scary about dry drowning is it's not overt and obvious like what we think about drowning. And so you have a long afternoon with your child in the summer heat and you come home and obviously they're gonna be fatigued, but how do you know if uh, your child has sustained any dry drowning. And really the key here is looking for signs of respiratory distress. If they are coughing, having trouble breathing, or chest pain, or um, really just more lethargic than the amount of exertion that, that uh, they put out. But ultimately what dry drowning is, is that closing of your airway because of a spasm when the water hit your windpipe. Okay, so it can be kind of tough. How come that doesn't happen when you're just drinking a glass of water? <laughs> yeah, because it's not going to your airway. It's going to the right pipe. Yep, so you're, you're, the way we swallow is pretty amazing because it really does help protect our airway a lot. Dr. Lauer, talk to us a little bit about the, some of the stuff that can be lurking in water and how do we distinguish good water from bad water? And good luck with that question. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, uh, one of the problems we have, especially in our area, is a lot of the... Uh, is just what gets into the water uh, into lakes and open areas around here so there's a lot of drainage especially <clears throat> excuse me after we've had a lot of rain uh, some of the drainage and sewage systems can overflow and end up with wastewater getting into what we think of as recreational water so uh, hopefully that's being monitored should be being monitored uh, signs posted uh, when there is that kind of overflow and contamination especially of e coli as this usual bacteria that gets into especially lake uh, lake water uh, in our area so it's important to uh, check out the quality of the water that uh, our children are swimming in where you know when you're going to the lake what's happened uh, at, at that specific lake recently uh, about the water quality and and how do you know as a parent whether the water quality is good or bad how do we, how do we know that um, there's well, hopefully this is it's posted. There are you know uh, agencies who monitor the water quality, and uh, there should be spots where that information is posted. But it can be really hard. I mean, it's not there's not big signs out. There's not uh, you know flashing bulletin boards that list this kind of thing. So parents uh, and families just need to be aware as they're heading to lakes, especially I think after times you know over this past week where we've had a lot of rain about uh, the drainage that could be getting into uh, lake water especially and, and checking that out. Yeah, and the lake water can get um, the things around the field, you can get fertilizer, you can get uh, right. you know cow poop, whatever it may be, it could be getting yep. in there. I always thought one of the better ways is to go to a public beach after a lot of rain because they tend to monitor that a little bit better. Correct, those, those should be uh, th things that have uh, areas that have lifeguards on them, things that are more public, uh, uh, the parks, beaches, things like that are, uh, should have better information <clears throat> about the local water quality. But as you said, um, everything that's upstream ends up, ends up in the lake. So just have to be aware of that and uh, paying attention to, to the quality of the water that's, you know, that our children are getting into. Yeah, for sure. That being All said, right, so I think, okay. So that being said, I think it's pretty, you know, um, most of the water is, is safe. We just should be checking those things out and, and confirming uh, before the whole family gets into the water. There you go. So now for children four years and younger, even shallow sources of water such as a bathtub or a toilet, a bucket can compose a drowning risk, guys. For one of you, either Dr. Sood or Dr. Lara, talk to me a little bit about why is that especially important to be thinking about in somebody who's four years and younger? Yeah, absolutely. I have uh, 
I work in a pediatric ICU, and unfortunately, I see patients after they sustained a serious drowning event, and it's children under four, like you mentioned, are very susceptible. When you watch movies, you see during a drowning scene, people yelling, splashing, and wailing, but unfortunately, that's not reality, especially for kids. A lot, oftentimes, drowning is a silent event. And so when a child is submerged underwater, especially somebody under four, they're using all their effort to push their hands at bay and keep their body up. And it takes a lot of exertion and energy just to try to keep their head afloat because the density and mass of a child's head versus the body is different than an adult where it's more proportional. And so they use all this exertion and energy just to keep their head above water and breathe, they don't have time to yell, and their hands are still submerged so they can't splash. And so if you look at the statistics, a lot of these drowning episodes occur when a parent is cooking dinner and supposed to be supervising the pool. And so vigilance is really key, but physiological differences between a child and an adult make uh, drowning often silent in children. And so things like toilets, bathtubs, or a swimming pool where you're not monitoring your child can be really dangerous if you're not keeping close attention to things. Yeah, something to think about. Well, let's go get some of our questions from our viewers. Jill Chadwick joins us this morning with those. Jill, what are folks, what are folks wanting to know? Good morning. We've got a little bit of everything. Um, I'm going to start with what we've just been talking about. Vicki wants to know, what is the treatment for dry drowning? I mean, is it something I can do at home? Yeah, so the treatment for dry drowning is the same treatment for regular, regular drowning, and it's really supportive care. And if you're worried that your child has a dry drowning episode, you need to come seek medical attention. And those signs and symptoms would be respiratory distress, cough, or really a lethargy. And what we do is just make sure that your child is oxygenating well and really provide supportive measures. So to be direct about my answer, there really is no specific treatment. Uh, it's very much so supportive care and ensuring that all your organ systems are getting the oxygenation they need. But if people are too, if the airway is too tight, there are ways to emergently get air into there, either by using a really small tube or even having to go through the trachea if you have to. Yeah, so unfortunately in the ICU, we do have to put breathing tubes in patients. And so if that airway is very closed, uh, we do have to, at some way, make sure that we um, oxygenate the lungs in any means possible. All right, Jill. Yeah, so kind of switching topics here. No Mad Cow, watching on YouTube, asks or says, Alameda County, California reinstated their mask mandate. LA appears to be headed towards that. St. Louis is considering it. Should we? And uh, I think we're talking question. about COVID. Sounds like we are. Yeah. Let's switch gears for just a mm -hmm. minute. And let's first get to the COVID count from Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Yeah, Hawk. hi. So we have 11 active infections uh, in the hospital right now, two in the ICU, zero on the ventilator, and then um, eight additional patients in that recovery period as well. So again, Steve, numbers are, are holding steady. Overall, I think maybe we're seeing, starting to see a trend of the cases that are being at least um, collected and identified uh, are going down. You know, hospitalizations are still good and going down, and of course, deaths are as well. So overall, not quite the surge that we saw with Delta and Omicron, which is what we hope for. And we are trying, we are tending to follow, I think, what UK and South Africa has seen as well. Yeah, so. it seems that way. And I think the question about why are some areas beginning to think about masks again and some are not, mm -hmm. has to do with that warning level by county and yeah. hospital stress that the CDC has talked about, Hawk. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that goes uh, to every community, as we have talked about, and every community has to be able to identify those things. And I think the county level data is, is very helpful for that. Uh, we know from a medical and a public health standpoint that masks are absolutely the best thing to help prevent the spread of disease. Uh, we know that when mask mandates are being evaluated, there's more than just the medical evidence that goes into making those decisions. There's been a lot of talk recently about one wave, what wave are we in, what happened to the Delta wave, yeah. the Omicron mm -hmm. wave, the, the new Omicron wave, what's going to happen with B4 and B5. There's a graph that, would, that I pulled for this morning's present, this discussion and presentation. Yeah. Yep. 
This shows the rise of the different kinds. So let's go to the other one first, guys. The, the, yep, this one. Mm. All right, this shows oh, since February of 2021 in a beautiful color scheme that looks like the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. You, you, it shows you where the alpha variant was more dominant, the rise then of the beta variant, the Delta variant, and then you can see Omicron, and now finally B Omicron BA.2. Um, uh, uh, now, there are different, more variants than BA. There, there's a lot of types of BA.2. But you can see in this graph, and this is a world graph that it's projected across the entire globe, that the majority of infections currently are being caused by Omicron BA.2. So let's go to the next, the next graph, and this is more specific to the United States. And what you see is the different types of BA2 that are is of the mm -hmm. May 28th. This is from Nowcast Hawk mm -hmm. on on, yeah. on well known to you yeah. uh, on the CDC website, demonstrating the rise of the BA2.12.1. <laughs> and and, yeah. and yet there's also some other forms of BA4 and BA5. So mm -hmm. from, from my standpoint, what we're seeing is exactly what we think we're going to see. Yeah. Which is that. COVID-19 has, and SARS-CoV-2 has the ability to mutate rapidly, mm -hmm. especially when there's widespread community transmission. Mm -hmm. And it can combine with other viruses. Sometimes it's been said the Omicron and Delta combined, that's Deltacron. Mm -hmm. um, but we're gonna have to just expect to see this ongoing yeah. evolution that occurs pretty rapidly. Yeah, I think that's right. And you know, I think if you just look at that, um, at the Nowcast again from the CDC, what we're seeing is that basically Omicron is out of there. It's more the BA2 variants. Uh, I looked at covariance.org a couple days ago. We know that there's a little smidge of BA4, I believe, in the United States as well. So we just have to expect these variants to continue to rise. But what is the safest way to go about uh, keeping yourself out of the hospital? Obviously, that's through vaccination. Uh, I was just looking through an article today published in Science Immunology uh, yesterday, just showing that those people that had uh, Pfizer vaccine and then got infection with Omicron actually developed very broad neutralizing antibodies uh, not only to Omicron but also to BA2 and also the other variants of concern as well. Um, they didn't develop it necessarily for BA4 and BA5 but overall what we're saying is that when you have those vaccines you've had those exposure to spike in that immune response if you do get infected, you can develop these other broad neutralizing antibodies. In addition, we know that those T cells, those conserved areas on the spike, uh, really with our T cells continue to help protect us and keep us out of the hospital. And that's what we're looking for moving forward. We know that immunization is the best and safest way to immunity. And most importantly, keeping you out of the hospital and out of the ICU. Yeah, I think case counts is kind of what we use to help yep. the signal things before. But now that we don't do that much public testing now, most of it's mm -hmm. home testing, uh, we don't really know the case counts. And so we have to use hospitalizations as the, as the best way to guide us. Hawkeye, okay, any thoughts about BA4 and BA5? Yeah. We know that some Western states, including Kansas and Missouri, are seeing some case rises in yeah. BA4 and BA5. Yeah, you know, like I said, this virus, you know, we anthropomorphize it. We, we put human characteristics on it, but, but really all it is doing is going through its replication process. And if there is some variant that seems to be more fit and is able to spread to the human population because of lack of neutralizing antibodies, that is what we see, um, you know, I think we have seen a little bit of the rise of BA4 in the United States, as I just said. Um, it probably can evade, you know, some of the, the antibodies that we have, and that is maybe owing to how it is spreading. But overall, I think we need to continue to understand that if you have some immunity, again, the safest way is through vaccination. Obviously, if you've had infection and vaccination, some people think that's more broad and that might be better. And then, of course, if you've been reinfected, you still you have immunity as well. So through those individual uh, assets of immunity, again, what we are hoping is that those hospital counts stay down. You are not having to go to the hospital. Our capacity stays well. But also, Steve, don't forget, we have early testing and early Paxlovid, especially for those people that are at high risk of progression. And we know that's really important. And Dr. Doolittle, in your work in the cancer field, you're a, you're a medical oncologist, you do a brilliant job of treating patients with cancer. You must be part of the gospel of preaching vaccination and early use of therapy to help patients stay safe. You know, absolutely. I mean, part of the challenge is it's one thing if we take the risk ourselves and choose not to be vaccinated, but every person that chooses not to be vaccinated is contributing to a hole that puts patients at risk. 
So this is one of those things where you participate and you do it be for the greater good. And particularly, you know, for me in the cancer center, it's just so important. I am still masking. I'm still masking outside of the cancer center. We're, because the concern I have is not so much that I will get COVID. The concern I have is that I'm going to give it to one of my patients. So for those of you that are kind of sitting on the rails still and trying to figure it out, this is something you do for yourself. It's true, but it's something you do for the, the greater good as well. All right, so a new study published in the British Medical Journal recommended a three-shot COVID-19 vaccine regimen. Now, we all believe that. We've been preaching that forever now. I think some of us are on to four shots or, or more. But it also found yeah. that equal results for three shots of the same vaccine or a mixture, meaning you can mix up the mRNA vaccines or even the J&J mm -hmm. Hawk. It's significant because it's the largest conducted on vaccine combination effectiveness, and it yeah. analyzed data from 100 million people. Scientists say it confirms the need for the number of doses to help boost immunity. Hawkeye, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think this is, this is very good. Um, you know, we still do have some experts who think that if you can just space out uh, the first and second doses, that's almost like the third dose. But I think what we have seen, the majority of the data really support those three exposures to spike. Again, safest way is going to be three exposures with the, the vaccine, but any combination of those three exposures. And I think this continues to support that. Um, so I think, it's, it's, I think it's really good information and very helpful. Um, and I think moving forward, we also have to understand that there are other vaccines that have uh, three doses as well. So this is obviously nothing new. It's nothing new. And just to say, we've given billions of doses of these yeah. vaccines now. Over 100,000 here at this, our own health system. mRNA vaccines have been around now for two and a half years for just COVID-19 and more than 10 years overall. Safe, safe safe. We just have to put the rest of the stuff to bed because it is incredibly safe. Yeah. So yeah. really quickly, Dr. Sud or Dr. Lauer, talk to us about safety in kids. Are we going to get good news for kids next week? Predictions. It's, um, it's, it's, it seems like we're, we are close to uh, the youngest kids uh, getting clearance to get the vaccine. We keep hearing dates coming up, hopefully over the next two to three weeks where uh, the FDA will uh, start that get that process going we'll be able to vaccinate the six month to five year olds that one group that still does not have uh, approval for for vaccines so yeah our hope is that soon that comes through and we're able to get that cohort uh, vaccinated which again is, is a large group of people and as uh, Dr. Doolittle referred to we just all need to be vaccinated be to be protecting each other uh, from the the rise of new variants uh, from, from COVID. So hopefully uh, more good news soon um, on the vaccines for those youngest kids. Okay, Hawkeye, some more data coming out about pregnant women being reluctant, even amongst Republicans, Democrats, vaccine believers, non believers about being vaccinated. I know. We've had Kerry Weineke on this show, our chair of OBGYN multiple times. Vaccination is safe in pregnant women and mm -hmm. in fact, strongly recommended because like influenza, COVID-19 has really bad outcomes for both mom and yeah. baby. Yeah, this is, this is so concerning. I mean, we are so uh, concerned about health of, of mom and baby, and we know that these, most of these uh, women that are pregnant are in that young age group uh, as well. And so not only are we looking to protect against the acute outcomes of COVID, but also those long-term outcomes. And we know vaccination can help with that. Um, have uh, had the opportunity to listen to a couple podcasts with Dr. Burks uh, lately, because she's been kind of on, on the circuit with her new book. And her, her, one of her main uh, topics of pointing is to just access. And it's not just access to vaccines or, uh, or therapies, but it's having that information associated with that access. And I, so I think we just have to continue to uh, endorse that message that is overwhelmingly positive uh, with the vast, vast majority of the data supporting that people or women uh, before pregnancy or during pregnancy who get vaccinated their outcomes are improved, outcomes for babies are improved, and it's most importantly, it's safe. So important. Okay, we are talking about sunscreen, skin and water safety this morning. Joining me is Dr. Gary Doolittle, a medical oncologist here at the Health System. Also joining are pediatricians, Dr. Steve Lauer and Dr. Sean Sud. Dr. Lauer and Dr. Sud. You know, I keep saying this wrong. You keep saying food, suit, I can get it right. In 2016, 43% of childhood drownings happened in open water, according to the National Drowning Prevention Alliance. What are those dangers? 
Yeah, open water is definitely very different than a swimming pool. In open water, visibility is different. In open water, depth is different, and uh, rip currents are very real. And so having conversations with your children or if you're traveling to a new area that you're not familiar with, it's really important to know these differences. But really the visibility, the depth, and the potential for rip currents are uh, are big dangers when it comes to open water. So that helps explain, I think, Dr. Lauer, why it's so important for a child to have a swim buddy. Yeah, this is especially as families start heading out now uh, and heading to the coast, getting to uh, open seawater where there's, again, those currents that uh, Dr. Sood referred to are there and just not something that we're used to in the Midwest. Uh, so paying attention uh, when to the local conditions when you're at a beach making sure that you know uh, checking with the lifeguards the usually have flags posted as to what the current situation is like but also yeah making sure that uh, your child is in your adolescence especially or in the water with somebody else going out alone is just uh, it, again this only takes a few minutes uh, to just take a, a great family vacation and turn it into a disaster so really uh, making sure your kids are matched up with somebody, they're in the water uh, together, uh, and somebody's keeping an eye on them all the time. So what type of safety equipment is out there to prevent drownings? Yeah. So it's life jackets. I still wear my life jacket. I go fly fishing a lot. I wade in the river, and especially when the water's a little high, a little damp, and I got my life jacket on. Yeah, life jackets are great. You want something that is uh, Coast Guard approved. And uh, another thing is like a shepherd's hook to have near your swimming pool or a portable telephone. Things where you can get access to uh, a life jacket, communication if you, need, uh, if you need help as well. I think when you have floaties or things like that in the swimming pool, it gives you a false sense of security. So making sure you're equipped with Coast Guard approved equipment is really important. So why, talk to us about the importance of swim lessons. I mean, I, to me, it's you know, intuitively we should all learn how to swim, just help protect ourselves and protect others. But wow, swim lessons are still a big deal. Yeah, I think if uh, we can take anything from today is everything is a layer of protection. And so when your child is ready to start swim lessons, some, some start early, but really uh, about four years of age is kind of when we really encourage start looking into swimming lessons. It's really important. But just because your child takes swim lessons and knows how to swim doesn't mean you can let your guard down. So everything we talked about today is uh, really important. But in specific regards to swim lessons, it just gives the autonomy to make sure you can get to a safe area when swimming and how to navigate a current if you're in an open water. But overall, um, it's all layers of protection together, whether it's a buddy system, whether it's swim lessons, whether it's making sure you know the depth and visibility, whether it's making sure you have the right equipment. So uh, I wanna really urge that vigilance is so important, not being impaired is so important, and combining everything together helps for a fun and safe summer. Wow, that's, that sounds like great advice. And as we think about the summer, we're gonna to have to go back to that topic, Dr. Doolittle, about sunscreen and, and trying to stay safe out in the sun. Jefferson City, Missouri now has sunscreen dispensers throughout the community. What do you think? I think it's great. It's just a real positive trend. We're seeing it through communities in Kansas as well. There are organizations in Kansas now that are providing uh, sunscreen dispensers at ballparks, soccer fields. You know, <clears throat> as a parent, you have so many things on your mind, and most of us are, have, we're a lot better at remembering the sunblock and throw it in the bag when we walk out the door. But for those of us that don't, and I'm right there with you, it's just nice to know you have these options that are ready, readily available. The other piece of this is even if you, know, you walk by it and you don't apply the sunscreen, there's a level of awareness that comes with seeing a dispenser in so many different places. This idea of enjoy the fun sun, but protect yourself at the same time. So it, it's a really positive uh, trend. I think Jeff City's really forward thinking. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. And um, talk to us a little bit about the types of sunscreen available, clothing with SPF, mm -hmm. physical, chemical. Talk about the differences, the benefits. Right. I, I really like the whole trend in the SPF labeled clothing. Um, the one thing that's really nice about it when these 
clothing lines first came out, they were really rather expensive, but you can go to Target and uh, get clothes with an SPF of 30, many an SPF, some protective factor of 50 or higher. They're relatively inexpensive and you can protect yourself easily. The other piece about sun protective clothing is that it's, you know, for Kansas summer, it can get really hot. And these are designed so that, it, you know, a long sleeve shirt in, you know, in a Kansas wheat field is actually more comfortable than you might think. So that, that's a huge improvement in, uh, in the trend, you know, the more and more we're seeing people that take time to protect themselves. So really, people are trying to be cool like me with my fly fishing gear on. Yeah. Logan, I'll try and send you a picture here in a minute. Oh. Next time I'm asking Gary a question, maybe we can find some super cool looks that I could have on like. But, okay, Dr. Doolittle, here's the question my wife and I get into. Mm -hmm. Spray screen or the old the spray stuff or the stuff you rub on with your hand? Mm -hmm. I've always thought, said the stuff you rub on with your hand is better. The spray stuff, half of it gets your mouth. And as a lung doctor, I don't like people mm -hmm. inhaling that stuff. Yeah, actually, a good point, good question, right? So the, the barrier blocks, we talked about zinc oxide. Um, you know, you have to apply them, and it's usually... Um, thick enough that you really notice it when you're applying it. The challenge is you want to make sure that you don't inhale that. And that goes for uh, titanium dioxide as well. For the chemical blocks, for the screens, it's a, different, it's a different animal altogether because we also worry about inhalation with the screens. But we, our bigger challenge, I think, is making sure we're applying enough and getting all sun-exposed areas. And that's where we may have a little bit of trouble. One easy way to handle the inhalation issue is to spray it in your hand and just wipe it over your body as you would a lotion. Um, those are all things to be wary of, but they're not things to keep us away from protecting ourselves, right? So Dr. Doolittle, that is great advice. And one of the questions I might still have though is, this relationship between sunscreen and melanoma is more always better for sunscreen, i.e. the higher SPF? Yeah, good question. I, you know, there's some data out there and some, uh, I wouldn't even say it's controversial. The reason the American Academy of Dermatologists recommends an SPF of 30 or higher is that 90% of UVA and UVB rays uh, are deflected with an SPF of 30 or, or greater. The SPF 50, yeah, it, it deflects a higher percentage, but not necessarily enough to clinically make a difference in that setting. I know many colleagues that recommend SPF 50 or greater and I wear SPS 50 or greater, and I still know the difference between 30 and 50, but would tell you if the American Academy of Dermatologists support the SPF 30 or better, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a really solid group. They've done, a, they've done their homework. That recommendation is, is a solid one. All right, Jill, let's go back to community questions or reporter questions if there are any out there. We do have some. Um, I'm going to stay kind of on topic, and then we do have some uh, COVID questions here at the end we need to tackle. Uh, I, I want jo, jo Ellen, she asked a couple of really good questions. The first part is, um, yes, there are the SPF clothing out there, but do I have to spend money on it? Can I just put on a, you know, a long sleeve shirt and I'm good to go? Great yeah. question, Gary. That is a great question. And you, you may actually get the kind of protection you're looking for. The reason I like the SPF level is you know exactly what you're wearing. And you know that that garment was approved at an SPF level of 30 or 50. Uh, you know exactly what level of protection you have. And I, again, this awareness piece on um, being careful in the sun, I'm, I'm still a big proponent of, of the labeled uh, wear that you can, the labeled clothes you can buy at, uh, at the store and, and Target. You know, like I say, I should, it's a commercial. I shouldn't have said that. You can say it. You You're can good. Go, you You're can good go ahead. anywhere. I do it you, too. You can find these, these articles very inexpensively. And I talk about the cool guys at K&K &K Fly Fishers like me who like to wear all sorts of layers of clothing. And we're going to show you a picture. I got one over to Logan and to Anthony in just a minute. Uh, no. We'll see how good I look with all my gear on. Jill. The second part of Joe Ellen's question is, why do some medications say that they um, warn about exposure to the sun? Right. So that it, some medications will actually cause a photosensitivity. And it's this issue of... The protection that you normally have with the skin is is no longer there, and it, it can depend on, upon the medication. It can also depend upon the coloring of the individual. Um, but if they say this puts you at greater risk of sunburn or this puts you at greater risk for sun uh, damage, you need to take it seriously because you can be out in a much shorter time period 
uh, with that and wind up with a, a blistering sunburn. And just to say, redheads, and Dr. Doolittle used to be a redhead. <laughs> Dana, I don't know what happened. Oh, okay, what I happened there? I don't know. We got old together. Yeah. But uh, redheads are especially at some risk here. Right. I, so people that have darker complexions produce a melanin that is more protective, and it's called eumelanin. And somebody like me or uh, Dr. Hawkinson, we produce a different kind of melanin called pheomelanin, and it is not as protective against uh, UV rays. So, you know, we, we talk about and we worry about the instance of skin cancer in this country and melanoma, and that the majority of the patients that suffer from these diseases are lighter complected. But it certainly can happen if, if you are darker complected. Melanoma can happen in any sub any group in our population. I really worry sometimes because sometimes I think the African American population gets left out when we're talking about skin cancer screening in particular melanoma. But in fact, a percentage are at risk and we need to be having that conversation about sun safety and sun protection uh, and skin screening in, in all groups that we treat. Jill. I'm glad you brought up the uh, dark skin because that was a question that Naomi had. But Casey wants to know, what if I just get a base tan? I'm good to go, right? Oh, base tan. I remember that. So, oh, if I just get my first good burn in the summer, I'm protected. That's what they said when I was a kid. I used to use, people would use iodine and, and, and baby uh, oil. oil. Use baby oil. Yeah, iodine baby oil. Yeah, you no. literally were frying in yeah. oil. Yes, I mean, were. that is what we <laughs> grew up That's what we grew up with. And I know tan, I just go red. I just think any time you're out in the sun and your skin gets exposed, you're at risk, right? If you, that whole idea of I'll just get this first sunburn and then the rest of the summer things are gonna be fine. Well, I actually get it because it happens for patients every day, it's still damaging. And part of it for me, and I know I'm on a little bit of a crusade, but that's because I was born a ginger and I have very pale skin. We go to the beach and my skin is lighter than the sand on the beach. So I've, I've grown up like in this kind of culture and I would just like it to help us shift just a little bit to, you know, fair is attractive, lighter skinned attractive. You don't have to be tan to be attractive. It's those kinds of things that are truly cultural. I mean, before the 1940s in this country, dark skin, tan was considered unfashionable. And then from the 1940s forward, it just flipped right around. So the idea of, yeah, I'm just gonna get this first exposure or this first burn and then I'm gonna be good, you're still at risk. I've worked so hard on my base tan. So <laughs> yes. I, but you're I, still at risk. I am, I, and I, I bet am. you preach that to I the am. kids. I am, I do still. And to tell you the so truth, straight. I wish I had your base. But I don't, and so I protect myself. Yeah, my base is closer to Gary's, but <laughs> you know, I think it is important to note that people who are darker complected still do have problems with, mm -hmm. with cancer Absolutely. and with melanoma. And in fact, it often goes unrecognized. We don't do a good enough job training people to look mm -hmm. for that. Absolutely, and you mm -hmm. know, I echo everything. Yeah. Jill. Okay, I can tell that we're going long, so I wanna rock through the next two questions. Then we're gonna have one drowning question, and then I'm gonna to get to the COVID. But um, Chada wants to know, is sunscreen a medication or a cosmetic? Is it FDA regulated? <laughs> That's an interesting. That's a great question. To tell you the honest truth, I don't know how the FDA regulates cosmetics. I do know the FDA regulates over-the-counter sunscreen products. So that's why all of these studies are being done now to look at the chemical agents in sunscreen that are the agent that prevents uh, sunburn or, or damage. The, one of the things, you know, having an SPF in cosmetics is nice, it's convenient, but the thing about that is you, remember you have to reapply, right? So if you put, put your makeup on in the morning and you decide to go to the beach and you think you're covered, you're really not. I mean, you've got a couple hours there and then, uh, and then also some of the SPFs and the cosmetic products are on the level of 15, and that isn't the recommendation for true sun protection. Georgian just wrote, uh, sorry, I lied. We have three questions real quick. But Georgian said, I got large blotches in, uh, from the sun at 17, and I stayed out of the sun since as much as possible. Were those blotches an allergic reaction? I have gotten milder reactions since. I, I think I've had that before, yeah, too. There's a, like sun poisoning. 
So I'm going to qualify this with I'm not a dermatologist. Yeah, I was going to say, mm -hmm. we I need really, a dermatologist in yeah. the program again. I really yep. admire the colleagues that I'm working with here at the health system right now. The great derm question, I will say this, we do know as internists there are patients that have sun sensitivity issues like this. Uh, but I'd have, to tell, I'd have to refer you to one of my colleagues to give you the, the scientific answer. Jill. Okay, and then Cindy wants to know, clouds block the rays, and this is in your wheelhouse, Dr. Doolittle. Mm -hmm. What are symptoms of skin yeah. cancer, and what do I need to be worried about? Okay, so clouds do block the rays, and, and yet you're still getting huge exposure mm -hmm. outside on a sunny day. So it is just on a, on a cloudy, cloudy day. day. So it's just critical that you block through that. Some of the worst sunburns I see are people who think it's cool out. I you know, don't feel hot. The, the normal triggers that we'd have to think we need to apply sunblock don't, don't necessarily apply in that setting. So for God's sakes, if you're out on a cloudy day, block just like you would if it was bright and sunny. And you had another thing there, Jill, didn't you? Well, she's symptoms. The symptoms of symptoms. Skin yeah, anyway. good. Yeah. So typically, any rough area of the skin is of concern. In my world, in melanoma, it's keeping track of the moles that you have on your body. If a mole changes, if it's itchy, if it bleeds, that's something you really want to get to your uh, primary care provider or a dermatologist. Um, the non-melanomanous skin cancers also just oftentimes present with a scaly, red, rolled up area in the skin. If there's any question at all, uh, particularly for a skin change, your best bet is to get with your, your primary or with a dermatologist. All right, all right. One question from Isaac about dry drowning and then the COVID questions. And I know that some people have had to go ahead and leave us because we're going a little bit long. but. Mm -hmm. Isaac wants to know, how does getting water up the nose not result in dry drowning? He says he goes down the slides all the time. He often gets it, but he's still here, which yeah. we are grateful. So one to 2% of all drowning episodes are dry drowning episodes. It's very rare. And uh, what dry drowning is, is a little bit of water that gets in your upper airway and a overreaction of that, the muscles in your upper airway, a true spasm that closes your windpipe. So for most people, 99% plus of the time, getting that water in your upper airway doesn't result in a spasm. And so for Isaac, he may in fact inhale a little bit of water in his upper airway, but he doesn't have this overreaction or spasm that leads to the consequences of drowning. Okay, Deed wants to know now, we're moving over to Dr. Hawkinson's territory. Please discuss ground glass lung opacity in post-COVID patients. Yeah, well this would certainly well, be I could, yeah, if you were to say, Dr. Yeah. Stites is a uh, Ground glass is a reaction. Sure. Uh, yeah, what happens I, guess, is, I guess that would include yeah, yeah. you too, sorry. The, the, when, when you get an infection, it doesn't have to be COVID. You can get this right. from influenza, you can get it from pneumonia, you can get it from drowning. You, um, the, the airway has little air sacs in it and sometimes the, the membrane inside those air sacs begins to collapse and you get fluid and other inflammation inside the airway or inside the air sac. And an x-ray, that looks like a ground glass picture. Mm -hmm. And it's that ground glass and it takes time for the body to essentially pump that fluid and stuff back out of the lung. So it has to heal. You cough a little bit of it out, but the reality is the majority of it's pumped back from the air sac, back into this tissue around and even into the blood vessels around yeah. your airway and in from your air sacs. And that's when the ground glass begins to resolve because that can take a while. And there can be multiple different kinds of, air, of, of inflammation and ground glass appearance. So it's all an outcome of some insult to the lung, whether it be SARS-CoV-2, yeah. community acquired pneumonia, drowning, burn inhalation, or inhalation, inhaling the wrong, wrong substances. So lots of different causes. Yeah, and I think we should say these are radiologic findings. And I think with most things in medicine, uh, diagnostics, whether that's labs or uh, x-rays or CT scans, you have to correlate that with how the clinical situation of that patient is. So uh, it's a general finding, just as Dr. Stite said, can be seen with, ver with many things, uh, but we also need to correlate that with the, the patient as, as a whole person. No, what are typical symptoms with the variant, the current one? Hawk, I think the variants yeah. all have really the same yeah. symptoms. It's like a cold, which it makes it so hard to distinguish. Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen throughout the, the pandemic and variants is that people have 
ascribed uh, a couple different symptoms to a couple different variants. You know, for the most part in the, in the large body of work, if you look back, they are really very similar. Um, a lot of things such as um, maybe headache, of course fever, cough, maybe some rhinorrhea, which is runny nose. Some people are getting sore throats, body aches. So there is uh, that, that large variety of, of those symptoms, which are fairly consistent throughout, uh, throughout the pandemic and when you have infection with SARS-CoV-2 in general. Bridget is asking, is a recommendation during a three-week chemotherapy cycle for the second booster still two weeks after treatment, or has that changed? Dr. D. You know, Richard, sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer this question. Uh, in my world, the, the drugs that I typically work with are immunotherapy drugs that boost the body's immune system. Uh, I'd have to refer to my colleagues that are more in the standard chemotherapy world to answer your question and would be happy to do that if I get your email address and we'll get you an answer properly. Yeah, and I think the thing to remember here is, uh, just as Dr. do a little stuff, you know, a lot of these agents are very different. I think you need to talk with your medical provider. Um, it's going to be important to do that when you have the height of some ability to main, uh, mount an immune response. And when you are in chemotherapy and, and your immune cells are knocked down, even when they come back, they may not be fully functional as well. So it's a very complex answer that you really need to discuss with that provider that is prescribing the, the chemo. And to say there are other things besides a, a vaccine, because we can also do Evyshell, yep. do different antibiotic mm -hmm. things, et cetera. So lots of different choices, not to mention Paxlovid, Jill. Gene gets the last question or comment, and he says, is it waiting until hospitals are full to require masking too late? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. You know, here's the balance, right? And, and we're, we're healthcare providers. We always think masking is great. And I haven't said yet, so I'm going to say it right now. Remember, the rules of infection prevention control travel with you wherever mm -hmm. you go. They always keep you safe right up until this moment, and they will going forward. So never hesitate to put on your mask to keep you and others around you safe. But having said all that, the, I think the key to this point is that you don't wait till hospitals are full. You see when the hospital trends are really starting to rise. The reality is we're a pretty low COVID count right now. Yeah. You know, we are acute around 10 or 11. Yeah. That's up from two or three. It is certainly not in the 100 range or 200 range we were just a few months ago. And so it's nowhere near that level yet. Is there widespread community transmission right now of this variant? Yes. Is that going to be with us for a very long time? Evidently so. The question is, are we safe from that? And the answer is you can be safe with your vaccination or with a combination of vaccine and immunity and if you get sick by going on Paxlovid, which is in good supply now. So we can manage our way through this, but we need your help. And the reality is this. If the numbers do start to rise in hospitals, you're going to hear us say that. And if they start to go up, we're going to ask people, start helping us more, folks, because we need your help. Because if we get too full, we can't take care of patients with heart attacks and strokes. It's not just the COVID folks. It's everybody we can't get the right level of care to. And we don't want to be in that situation. So that's when we ask for your help. And that's when we turn to everyone and say, hey, let's get masks back on. We're not saying that yet. We don't feel that pressure in the hospital. Because what's happening is, in the meantime, there's a whole lot, a lot of folks there who, who have businesses and other issues around the economy that want to keep their business open. We all know that masking does has been hurting the economy. So it's just that balance. And we're not the politicians. We're the health folks. We're going to tell you the truth. We're going to tell you, not the politicians don't need to meet that implication, but rather that we're going to tell you what it's like here from a public health perspective. And we'll tell you when the numbers start to rise and we start getting in trouble. Hawk, we're just not there yet. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I think we just kind of just like you said. Keep us safe. That's, All right. Yeah. Let's get to final thoughts for our guest, Dr. Doolittle. I'm going to start with you. Just would really encourage everyone to be thoughtful about the sun protection and sun safe practices, right? And just make it part of your, your daily routine. Um, protecting yourself from the sun protects you from getting normal or non-invasive skin cancers. It's definitely protective against melanoma. All right, let's switch now to Dr. Lauer. Um, I think it's Everything we've talked about here today is import, the importance of just a little preparation. After the last couple of summers, we want families and kids, our kids especially, to be outside more physically active than they've been able to be in the last two years. And that's so important on many fronts. What we're talking about is just a few layers of protection, a few minutes of making sure you're ready uh, and protect against those common dangers out there, and then go have a, a fun, safe summer. Dr. Sid. 
Yeah, just perspective. Working in the pediatric ICU, we see the worst accidents, whether it's burnings on 4th of July, ATV accidents or drownings like we talked about today. And so the biggest piece of advice and perspective is just being vigilant and taking that extra time, like Dr. Lauer said, just to make sure uh, you have safe precautions and have fun at the same time as well. Dr. Hawk. Yeah. Well, I'm still going to be waiting for that picture of you with the sunscreen on your head and on your nose and your right. farmer tan at the beach. So uh, what I would like to say is we've had some good uh, conversations today and maybe just a little bit teaser for next week and also maybe for Alexis who is coming up. You know, people do spend a lot of time outdoors. We've heard Dr. Uh, Stites talk about his, his fishing and time outdoors. It's very important to remember, especially now with uh, the warm and good weather. We are in that tick-borne illness and uh, mosquito season, so it's very important to wear insect repellent as well. If you are out doing those activities, it is vitally important to apply your sunscreen first and then your bug repellent after that. Uh, that will help protect you from the sun and, of course, uh, any little critters that may get on you as well. So. All right. Uh, that's my advice. Thank you. And thanks to the guests who did a great job today. Is there a photo of me fly fishing, perhaps, ready to be seen? Yes, staying covered. Notice how cool covered I am there. I look good. And yes, I'm not the guy with a long beard. I had a shorter beard back when I actually had hair. All right. When you think of sun protection, you might think of, you might not think of food, but what we eat can make a difference. Across the campuses of the University of Kansas Medical Center and Health System are some botanic gardens popping up. Many are producing fruits and vegetables. Alexis Del Cid is live at that new garden this morning. Alexis. Dr. Stites, this is such a great morning. It's so peaceful out here. And yes, you're right, you know, leafy greens can be great sun protectors if you eat them regularly. You can't just have a salad and then go sit out in the sun and think you're good to go. But I'm here at the community gardens that are outside Cambridge Tower A. We're here at 39th Avenue and State Line. And in just a few hours, everyone's gonna be here planting these beautiful fruits and vegetables. And I'm here with two very important people who have a big role in this. I'm with Jeff Navor, who's the VP of Hospitality Services, and also with Sarah Norris, who's the program manager of community gardens. This is going to be great. This is one of 12. There are 11 others on the Med Center side. What inspired the one on this location, Jeff? You know, we've been working with our friends at the university for some time now to find a way to better collaborate with the gardens on this campus because they really are amazing. Everybody comes down here and you see the big buildings and the parking lots and, and all the commotion. But there's really a hidden gem on this campus, and it's the gardens that are interspersed. So this is really our first opportunity to partner there. And Sarah, gardening is your passion. You're passionate about horticulture. It's in your family. What inspired you to get involved in something like this and take this on? As really, it's your, it's your life's work right now. It is. Well, the mission of the Botanic Gardens is just to explore the critical role that plants and nature play in our lives which includes the food we eat, the medicines we take, and our mental and emotional well-being. So we love having opportunities, creating opportunities for people to just be out in the gardens, get their hands dirty, get some fresh air, sunshine, get away from a stressful environment. Um, we enjoy it and we like sharing it with people. So Cliff Irwin, our intrepid photojournalist, is showing you a close-up shot of the stockyard tanks. There are seven of these, and each tank will have different combinations of vegetables and herbs once they're planted. What's going to be planted here, Sarah? Well, we themed them. There's seven uh, cattle troughs, and so we'll have things like a pizza garden that will have tomatoes and some basil and oregano, a stir-fry garden, salsa garden, a couple uh, salad bar gardens, and we'll have two two herbal tea gardens, one more soothing and one more invigorating. I love hearing you talk about plants and herbs. I would like to record you. It just makes me feel peaceful as you rattle off herbs and plants and things of that nature. Jeff, who's going to get to use and eat and, and um, do the gardening? Where did all the good stuff go once it's harvested? Well, really anybody can come and, and take something from the garden. But Like a community member could come and yeah. grab some things for their we tea? Come up and, and, and take a sample, but what we're really hoping to do is to be able to utilize what we harvest in our cafes here on the, on the hospital campus. This is kind of a fun fact on the other side of this wall is a cafe where we love to get our wings, and we've always talked about the wings on the morning medical update. This will be a little healthy addition to the wings, right? Um, how do people who are watching this right now find the different locations? 
So I'll let you kind of address that. Um, so we have social media, Facebook and Instagram. You are always welcome to contact us through that and we can give a guided tour, but the Botanic Gardens is actually open to the public. It's just all the gardens here on campus. We do have a map on the website that you can follow. Um, and we are starting to do some wellness walks as well that will be some guided tours. And that leads us to our next point is that not only are these herbs and vegetables going to go and, and be harvested for use in the cafeteria, but this will also be part of a wellness plan for patients and people in the community. Can you explain a little bit, Sarah, you were talking about how this can help mentally, but also help people physically being out and gardening and being around nature? Well, in today's society, it feels like we're always at computers or we're inside. We, we very rarely get outside, so we love to share what we are doing in the gardens. Just the ability to get some dirt on your hands. There's a lot of studies that have shown that there's, there's healthy bacteria in the soil that can sort of simulate um, that happy feeling. Uh, a lot of gardeners will actually say that being in the garden is their happy place. Jeff, you have a tie on. You ready to roll up your sleeves and put your hands in the dirt? Absolutely. This <laughs> afternoon, we're going to be out here and we're going to fill all of these containers with all kinds of good stuff. Oh, this is great. So this is just a beautiful place to be. It'd be a great place to come out and eat your lunch or walk by and take a tour. And Dr. Stites, did you know there are also other fruits and vegetables that can protect against the sun? I'm going to rattle off a few. Carrots. Some carrots are going to be planted out here. Beta carotene provided in the carrots gives natural sun protection for up to 10 weeks after you're eating them for 10 weeks. Again, you can't just have a carrot and go sit out in the sun. But blueberries, watermelon, carrots, cauliflower, all of those are great things to add to your diet to offer beneficial sun protection as the sun is shining in my face right now. I think I'm going to go inside and eat some carrots and blueberries. That looks awesome. You know what? I love carrots, blueberries, watermelon, and even cauliflower. Not something I liked when I was young, but I like it a lot more as an older adult. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being with us today. Alexis, thank you. I can't wait to check out that garden. Don't forget you can catch our shows anytime by logging in to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Jess will be back on Monday, thank goodness. We'll see you all then. Have a great and safe weekend. They are the wounds you cannot see. Many veterans live day to day struggling with mental health illness. I'm Jessica Lovell, Monday at 8. The help available to veterans here in the Metro. Join us on these social media channels. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.